Well, I'd like to give an idea of where I think we're at and why things are getting so difficult. We've had 30 years or more of shifting of wealth uh, from the bulk of the population to the top 1% or perhaps a fraction of 1%, both the earnings and, and unearned income. We've had 30 years or more of an ideology that governments are bad. So the, problem, the state is a problem, not a solution, is, is the mantra. And we've had 30 years of climate change, uh, which has become more and more apparent and is lead, leading us to another disaster, to a disaster of a different kind. Uh, within that, uh, there have been sporadic fightbacks, but we're at a point now where we either make a big breakthrough going against this trend, or we will be in, in a real disastrous state. Um, so, in, in Britain, the uh, privatization of the NHS is in full flood. I haven't got time to go into the detail, but I think anybody who is observing knows what's happened. Labour started with, with a big group in the Department of Health plotting the breakup of the NHS and the privatization. It ran for eight years or so, completely unknown, uh, based on lies that nothing was happening. And of course the Conservatives and Lib Dems have come in and are pursuing that rapidly. Uh, they're trying to push it even faster, but as it is, Every month now there are major privatizations uh, and the policies and the, and the law is in place uh, to carry it on. And at the same time, of course, there are enormous cuts, 20 billion pounds of cuts, which means that there just isn't enough money for a good health service for all. So the private sector is there. It's getting more and more expensive because they're taking their cut. At the same time, the amount of money available is less and less. The cost of medical care goes up because it's very labor-intensive and because of new technology and, and treatments and so on. So the good treatment, the idea that most people in the country, or virtually everybody in the country, could get the up-to-date treatment is going out the window. At the same time, when we really are going to make enormous progress, some people will live a lot longer. Uh, now, when we talk about whether they're living longer and happier, we move to the county level, where the, when we're talking about how happy that old age will be, uh, we're beginning to impinge on the issues that affect the county council quite directly, which is responsible for adult social care, which is largely older people, but it's disabled people, of course, of all ages, and people with more severe disabilities are living, so we have children with disabilities, middle-aged people, and so on, in addition to the growing number of people who are living past 85, when our minds and bodies begin to really fall apart. And there, in Oxfordshire, the whole service is already privatized. Uh, the consequences are, first, we can't guarantee quality. Uh, you can never completely guarantee quality, but when you run the service yourself, you hire the people, you train the people, you create the protocols, you monitor them, you discipline them if they don't do it right. That's all gone. We have to hope that the private companies and the individuals, the hundreds and thousands of different companies and individuals, who are doing the work, uh, do it well. And most of them will. People are not bad. But there's a huge amount of money involved. There are corners, corners to be cut. And we have no guarantees is what's happening. The, re the regulators are going to have an incredibly difficult time. There are things to be done. Uh, there are things to make it easier for carers in it and users of the services to say what's happening. But that hasn't really happened in Oxfordshire. Although the Green Party has made very practical uh, suggestions as to how that might be done. And of course the other side of it is, again is the cuts in, in, in financing. We don't have, so the private companies can't find the staff at, those, at the wages uh, that they can pay based on the amount of money that the government is making available. Uh, so the quality of service can't be guaranteed. We know that there are people who are doing it, many of the best ones have had to leave because they can't earn enough money to live on, even though they're willing to work for quite little. Because we're at the stage now where people frequently don't get paid from going from client to client. How can they make a living when half the time their workday is not uh, being paid for? So we're in a, a desperate situation there, and again it's getting worse, uh, and more and more fragmented, and less and less well financed. The, which brings us to the whole question of local government, not only county, but uh, city council level. The, uh, the money has been withdrawn, uh, the powers have been withdrawn, it's a very, very 
It has been a centralized state in Britain for a long time. It is now excess, extremely centralized. Uh, and local government, which could be the real star of government, it reaches into into localities. It's people that uh, run by people, councillors that people know, that they can contact easily, that they can have an impact on. Uh, all that is becoming less and less relevant because the powers that those councils have uh, is reducing every, uh, constantly. And, so and the theory behind it re of small government is has won the day so far. But I think that people are beginning to become aware of the difference, uh, that this cannot, should not carry on. And of course within that area is the area why it's important for the Green Party to do well. And so far we have done fairly well but not well enough to make the difference that's necessary. So my view is that the only way to shift the major party, which would have to be the Labour Party, in the direction that we would want, is for the, paradoxically, is for the Green Party to do well against the Labour Party. In the same way as poor Ed Miliband, the, the son of immigrants, has had to make speech after speech uh, apologizing for Labour having been too kind to immigrants because he fears UKIP and, and uh, the move of voters against uh, Labour because of uh, supposed problems of immigration. We w need to make Labour worry about the loss of voters because they're not going to save the NHS, because they're not going to recreate uh, local government. And I think that's where we fit in, and that's why it's very important to work hard and effectively now. So, Larry, what's about uh, education and your view of the academisation of schools in Oxfordshire? Well, I think there are two things I want to say about that. First of all, academisation in many ways is not relevant. Uh, the schools were not run by the county council, so the, the changes in that sense are not great. Some have gotten better in, in, in narrow terms, some have gotten worse again in narrow terms. And nobody has been discussing what I think is the crucial thing about education, which is all the subtle things that ways in which learning things changes our lives, um, and that we haven't had discussed. We have got a very good. We're very lucky in Oxford with the new uh, uh, Story Museum, which is run by people, established by people who do know about education. It's outside of both of the privatization and academization and of the state system, and it's a. It's about what is important and how children and humans actually learn through telling each other stories about our lives and what we think about life and, and, and getting down to the nitty gritty. And stories do that. So we're very lucky there. But in real life, our education has become narrower, more focused on crummy exams. Uh, it's better for children to pass them than not to pass them. Uh, but it's very hard to get excited about it because it doesn't matter for their lives. And in terms of life chances, a society was becoming more and more unequal. The children of very rich parents are going to have miles head start over children of, of poorer and poorer parents. So that's where the, the devastation on that level is happening. And education is not being allowed to to do things for people uh, that are outside the money market. So we've lost on both on both scores. It, 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 we were lucky in a way by opposing the the uh, private the Academy at uh, at Oxford School, which is in which is in the area that covers the area that we've had county councillors in, we opposed that, and we slowed it up so much that the original uh, chain of schools that was going to take it over, which turned out to be a failing chain, which would have been a total disaster, and which involved selling off half of the school grounds for 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 resident for housing in the midst of a desperately overbuilt neighbourhood which would have also meant losing uh, half of Cowley Marsh Park, which is one of the little, little bits of greenery in the area. So by delaying it, we actually stopped that, and the new academy that came in is not as bad, and, we, and it hasn't involved selling off the land. So that was very lucky. Um, so uh, let's, let's uh, move on to another subject. Let's talk about sort of transport, and obviously county has a, a big role in, in transport provision. Well, the county's role in transport, we have to say, is a disaster. If you look at the key statistics for the country and compare them to Oxfordshire, the killed KSI, the very crude, killed and severely injured category, 
for the last five years or six years, the county council, while the rest of the country has reduced their accident rate and death rate by 26%, a very substantial amount, Oxfordshire just hasn't moved. We're at a front line. Well, if you translate that into, into numbers, which I can't at the moment, there's dozens and dozens of people who have been severely injured, and something has gone drastically wrong. Now, we, we don't pay a lot uh, for roads compared to other counties, so that's probably part of it. We privatized uh, more of it sooner, so that may be part of it. And, of course, the most glaring statistic has to do with uh, cycling, where not that we haven't reduced accidents, but they've actually doubled in the last 10 years. So the killed and severely injured rate for cyclists has gone through the roof. Uh, and, and people we all know have paid a huge price for that. And if you look at the potholes and you look at this, the sides of roads and you look at the lack of the poor education that many schools have had uh, for cycling and poor education for truck drivers, then we begin to get a reason for it. So it's not completely clear why we've done so badly, but we have done badly. And what is worse is that there has been no determination to improve things. And we have, I have raised questions at almost every county council for the last year about this. Um, I hope it's making a difference. It's not yet available in statistics that it is making a difference. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about climate change. Obviously, there's quite a lot that the county does that impacts on energy use and carbon emissions. So, so where is the county with that and what's the green uh, perspective? The county has never been more than mediocre and, and frequently uh, less than mediocre even in, in, in changing, in reducing uh, carbon emissions in the buildings it controls, in the schools and the, and the many buildings that the county operates. Uh, they haven't met their targets and they weren't uh, enormously ambitious targets to start with. But not only haven't they done it where they have a clear responsibility, but they haven't taken the step beyond that. And for the last two budgets, or more maybe, the Green Group has put into the budget substantial amounts of money for going out and uh, insulating houses in large tracts of the county, essentially the ones in which there is the most poverty. So we would get two advantages. We would insulate, in the last budget we estimated something like 30,000 houses we could insulate. A lot of them would be for people who can't afford to heat them well enough. So we would attack fuel poverty, which is ends up in hospital and death because we have a, a very crazy uh, blip. It's not a blip, a big change in the death rate for older people in the winter, which they don't have in Scandinavia where it's really cold. So the failure to be able to heat houses has a desperate impact. We could have done, done away with most of that by tackling the poorest areas of the county. We wouldn't have gotten rid of all of it, but we probably would have gotten rid of 80 or 90 percent of it. So it's very sad. And of course the other side of it would have been that Oxfordshire would have been making a real contribution towards the saving of carbon emissions. And we know now that we, not that they were wrong in how bad the climate change was getting, but that it's actually the scientists thought it was going to be slower than it's turning out to be. And we're going to have this increase of two degrees that's talked about, and maybe more. And the droughts, the, the floods we've had here, the droughts that they've had in, in, in North America, which have affected our food prices, all those things are with us. We're going to pay a heavy price, and the poorer part of the world will pay an even larger price for the failure. So we could have made a real difference, and we can still, the world is not finished, make a real difference for the sake of, of our futures, for the future of the world, and starting off by doing away with this obscenity of people having to choose between food and eating. Okay, um, let's move on to the green budget. So every year the Greens put together an alternative county budget, uh, which shows how, you know, if the Greens were in, in power, how we would change the spending priorities of, of the council to, to really make a difference. So do you want to talk us a little bit through the, the last green budget and some of the themes in that? Yes, thanks for that. I think the budget thing is very important because it's very easy to say, oh, we'd like to have all of that, and we'd like that and uh, we do away with taxes and so on, but that's not the way the world works. So if you want to be serious, you have to show what your priorities are, and you do that in, in saying this is what we're going to do, 
this we won't do, and this is how much we're going to raise by taxes. We are not keen tax raises. In six of the eight last years, we had the lowest uh, proposed uh, council tax rate of all the parties on the county council. But in the last two years, with the government cuts reaching such a crescendo, we have changed our policy. And in both of those years, we have proposed higher tax rates rises than the other parties. But we've done it because it's necessary and because it's not that much money. So the last year, for instance, we said we the cuts for older people, over 30 million pounds coming up, on the following on about 30 million of the last three years. So really, the whole capacity of people to live safely at home or to be able to go to re residential care if they need it is being compromised. And we said we can't allow that. So we put a budget together which would have raised enough money so that there would have been effectively no care cuts for the elderly. And we did that, and, and a number of other things we were able to do by proposing a, a tax increase of £20.44 a year more than the Conservative budget. That's a pound seventy uh, a month, uh, 40 pence a week. So not a lot of money, but it would have made a very big difference. We would have gotten the libraries up to professional standard again. Uh, we would have been able to, as I said before, we talked about uh, insulating 30,000 houses. Uh, we would have put money into these roads that we talk about that are killing and severely injuring people. Um, we would have uh, been able to keep our children's centers, which are, are really a big improvement. They're one of the few social things that inventions of recent years that have made a difference to people's lives. But they're being cut back dramatically, and we put all the money back that's being cut out of that. So I'm very proud that we had the political courage to say, look, there are times when even a, a rotten tax like the council tax, it's better to pay a little bit extra rather than to sacrifice our fellow citizens. Great, thank you. Um, let's, let's go back to social care a bit, and you've talked a bit about that already, but maybe you can just summarise some of the issues around social care and, and dig a little bit more into the, the issues around the budget. Right, well, there are two things. First of all, you can't have the social care without the money going into it. It's, it's labour-intensive. If you need, people need help getting out of bed, getting dressed, getting fed, uh, getting out to see the world, playing a part in the world, they need other people to help them with that. And to do that systematically, you need to pay people. Now, there is a huge room for volunteering and for good citizenship, but you again need a solid core to make that work. And in fact, our, our budget was based on two things. First, we put the money back in, so it can happen. And secondly, we said, we'll build community by community. We're not going to just do it from the center. There are thousands of groups running lunch clubs, uh, transport systems for, for local people, all sorts of very nice things that are happening. But there are huge patches where it doesn't happen. Sometimes it's one or two people that make it happen. They get old, they, they become ill. There is no system to preserve and build on what is already happening. And that is the role of government. We are not separate from people. A good government makes for good pop volunteer work. Good volunteers make for good government. And our budget is based on that. Build on the communities, but have, make sure that the crucial work is there, is there to be done by well-trained, well-paid people. Great. Uh, Councillor Larry Saunders, thank you very much. Thank you very much.